Father in heaven, we love you so much. We're so thankful for who you are and what you've done. And Father, as we enter into this new season, Lord, it's going to take not just faith, but it's going to take courageous faith by each and every one of us. So Father, as we open up the book of Joshua, I pray that you will allow the words of my mouth to be found acceptable in your sight. And and just as importantly, Lord, that my heart posture, Lord, may be found pure as I stand before you and before God's people. Lord, help us to focus this morning. Help us to fix our eyes on you. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. amen, amen. I got a question for you this morning. What type of person does God use? What type of person does God use? Who does God use? I don't know if you've ever asked that question to yourself before, but you may say, you may ask the question, does does God use older people or does he use younger people, right? And you read the scriptures and you say, the answer is yes, right? Or does does God use rich people or does he use poor people? And you go through the scriptures and you see that he uses both, right? Does he use smart people? And simple people, right? The answer is yes, right? We know this. I heard you saying it from the crowd that God uses all people, right? And there's patterns that we see throughout the Bible. And I think we could put it a little bit more pointedly. When we ask the question, who does God use? The answer is this. The person that wants to be used. God uses the person that wants to to be used. Who does God use? He used the person that cares. The person who has and steps out on courageous faith. Radiant City, listen to me this morning. God comes where he's wanted and God comes where he is welcomed. And what we're going to learn and be reminded of from the book of Joshua is that God cares a lot more about our availability than he does our ability. He cares a lot more about our availability than he does our ability. That's why I've been inviting you into this grand journey to live out your Christian faith and to be strong and courageous. And so if you have your copy of God's word, hey, listen, it's not going to be up on the screen. So this morning, I'm really going to ask you to participate. Grab your phone out and use your Bible app. Or if you have a physical copy of God's word, like I see Noelle does, and she gets her notes ready, go ahead and bring that out as well, okay? We're not going to allow technology to stop us from being able to worship God, right? All right? And, and if you don't have a Bible app, go ahead and go to apps in your phone, download it. If you are of a different generation, there's younger people here that can help you with that, all right? But if you have your Bible open to the book of Joshua chapter 1, go ahead and say amen. amen. If you don't have it open, say, Lord, help me. Somebody said, Lord, help me. So somebody help me. All right? This is what God says starting in verse 1 of chapter 1 in the book of Joshua. He says, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Also, okay, so let's just go ahead and stop here. Let's talk about who Joshua is and what the book of Joshua is all about. So this is our first week in the book. First, who is Joshua? You can sum, sum it up three different ways, right? Joshua was a son, he was a soldier. And he was a spy. He was a son. If you look in the book of 1 Chronicles, we find out that Joshua was the firstborn of Nun. Actually pronounced Noon, but we'll just stick with Nun for this morning, all right? And here's what that means. And what it means is, which is so cool, is that after the Passover, and at Passover, rather, Joshua was saved because his parents put blood over the door. Isn't that a fun fact from the Bible this morning? So let's not forget this. Why is that important? It's important because if you want to be used by God, you need to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Joshua believed in God, and more importantly, early on, his parents also believed in God. And I just want to share with us as parents, one of the greatest gifts God gives his children outside of salvation itself is believing parents. It's parents who can instruct their children in the way that they should go so that they don't turn from it. For parents that can point their kids to Jesus and say, hey, you're not perfect, but he is. Place your faith and trust in him. It's parents who say that you're not identified 
by your performance. No, you're identified by your position in Christ, by placing your faith and trust in Jesus. And so the first thing we see about Joshua is that he had godly parents. Let me encourage you, if you are a teacher, an educator, a caregiver, or a parent, you never know how much of a difference you're making in your kid's life as you're being faithful to Christ. The second thing that God uses in his life is that Joshua was a soldier. The first time we see Joshua's name pop up in the Bible, anybody know what book it is? It's in Exodus. Exodus chapter 17, and Joshua is fighting the Amalekites. It's a small battle. It's mentioned briefly, but the principle we can grasp from it is this. If you, as a Christian, are going to be courageous, you're going to fight battles. (laughs) If you're going to fight bigger battles later in life, you need to fight the little battles earlier in life. Let me say that again. If you're going to fight bigger battles later in life, you need to fight little battles earlier in life. You know, as I look back at my life and the problems and the things that I still wrestle with, even today, the challenges and the struggles that I have, there are problems in my life. They're there because of battles I didn't face early on in my life. Does that make sense? You know, honestly, the same is true for you if you take time to think about it. You know, I, I was... Um, I don't know if musically if you know this. I love hip-hop. I love Christian hip-hop. And there's this um, Christian hip-hop artist by the name of Andy Minio. And one of his songs, listen to what he says. He says this. He says, I figured I'd be past all this hurt by now. But after all this time, it's only worse right now. Because when you bury emotions, you bury them alive. And they only come back stronger somewhere later in your life. You got to fight your battles now. So Joshua was a son, a saved son for the godly family. The second thing, we see that he is a soldier that's willing to fight battles. And thirdly, and most known and famous, what he's famous for is being one of the 12 tribes, right? Joshua and his homeboy Caleb, right? And if you want to read that in your city groups this week, it's in Numbers chapter 13 where we see Moses. He has the promises of God. He goes before the people and he sends out 12 spies to go into the land and 10 of them come back, right? And they're like, nah, bruh, I don't want the smoke. I don't want it to have to do with any of that. They are too big. They are too hard. It's too hard. And this is too much for us. But only Joshua will come back. And what does Joshua and Caleb say? We can do this. The Lord got this. Let's go. Let's make it happen. So who does God use? God uses the person that cares. He uses the person that wants to be used. And God uses so many things in our life, even the small little battles he calls us to when we're young and when we're growing. And so my question for you this morning as we jump into this sermon series is, are you willing to fight your battles? Are you ready to put on the full armor of God and are you ready to be strong and courageous? That called us to every single person who bears the name of Jesus. We got to be strong and courageous. The Christian life, it's not all peaches and roses. It is war. It's war. And so we have to, as Christian missionaries, have to be an army for the Lord. The time is now, Radiant City. It ain't yesterday. It ain't tomorrow. The time is right now. And so I want to encourage you to fight your battles now, to cultivate godly attributes in your life now, to be a person of courageous faith now, today. That's who Joshua is. Let's keep going in verse 2. Go ahead and look at your, your phones or your Bibles. Verse 2 says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land that I am giving the Israelites. This is what the whole Bible, this is what the whole book of Joshua, rather, is all about. It's about land. There's this Jordan River that nobody's passed over for 40 years. And now it's time to cross. And really, you can sum up the whole book of Joshua in one phrase. It is this. You can write this down. It is stop complaining and start conquering and claiming. Stop complaining and start conquering and complaining. The entire book of Exodus, what do we see? The people of Israel, they're out in the desert. They're wandering. And what are they doing? Complaining and grumbling against Moses. And so... Whatever you are complaining about right now in your life, and don't get me wrong, like I don't want to be 
unempathetic. No, hear me out on this. I know we're going through some difficult trial and challenging seasons and some things we're, we're wrestling with in life. I want to say maybe just maybe that God wants to use you to conquer those things in your life. And so I'm praying you'll be strong and courageous. Where? Anywhere that you've been complaining. Where? Anywhere that you've accepted defeat and just said, my life's just going to be like this for the rest of my life. Where? Anywhere where you're making excuses. We're all good at that, don't we? Where? Anywhere where you've just been in the same place and you've just been stuck. Anybody there this morning? Because God tells us we got to move forward. And he doesn't just tell us to move forward. He tells us how to move forward. Look at what God says in verse 3. Verses 3. I'm going to read it from two different translations. I want you to pay attention to something here. First from the CSB in verse 3, he says, I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Now in the ESV, listen to how it reads. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread, watch it now, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. Will tread upon, I have given to you. Do you see what God is doing? God is using present and future tense in the same sentence. Does does God have a grammar problem? Does the the, the author of language have have a language problem? No. Did he misspeak? No. Do you see what God is saying here in the text? What he's saying is, is that you need to go and take this land, but I've already given it to you. You need to go and take the land, but I've already given it to you. This is a New Testament principle that's rooted in something known as the promises of God. And what do I mean by that? What should motivate us as the people of God to welcome and walk in the purposes of God is the promises of God. What should motivate us as the people of God to welcome and walk in the purposes of God are the promises of God. And so that's the first thing I want you to write down as as a point, if you're taking note, is this, is that in order for us to walk in courageous faith, we must know the promises of God. We must know the promises of God. Do you know how many promises there are written in the Bible? Anybody? Over 7,500. Do you know how many verses there are in the Bible? A little over 32,000. What does that mean? It means that 25% of the Bible... It's actually a promise. You thought about that? Isn't that crazy? So if 25% of the Bible is promise, then we should know them. Should we not? If God speaks through his word, he speaks through his people, and he speaks through his spirit, and by his word, he speaks through principle, law, and he speaks by promise. By principle, that's mostly the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs, these are generally true statements about how we should live. But then God also speaks by law. That's the most common way he speaks. But then he also speaks in promise. And by promise, I I, I want you to do do a homework assignment this week. And throughout this sermon series, just start looking for the promises of God in the word of God. Like, there are promises in the Bible for you and your family. Find them and know them. There are promises in the Bible For your future. Find them and know them. There are promises in the Bible about how God is going to be with you through hard circumstances and challenges and grief. Like, man, we need to know those when we go through those times, don't we? Know them and talk about them regularly. Talk about them with your city group, your DNA group, as people are coming in. You know, my brother, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, you know, he's in the NFL and he was having a hard time in the NFL. Some things were going on. And I just said, man, listen, man, Romans 8, 28, man. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called to their purposes. Amen. I don't know what you're going through right now, bro. I don't know what God is doing in the grand scheme of things. But what I can tell you is if you're, if you're in Christ, he's using all these things for your good and his glory. Amen. We need to know the, the promises of God. Because for the Christian, our hope is rooted in the promises of God. Jesus says, I'm in the resurrection and the life that whoever believes in me shall not die, right? But have eternal life. 
The whole entire Christian faith is rooted in a promise that was supported by a fact, right? That God won't fail us, that he is faithful, that he is for us, and that eventually at the end of this thing, we're going to live with him forever. You have to know God's promises. But number two, you also have to know what place you're in. You got to know what place you're in. For us to walk in courageous faith, you must know what place you're in. You probably heard it said this way before, right? You have to know where you've been before you can appropriately know where you're supposed to go. Look with me at verses 4 and 5. This is a way to think about your life. Starting in verse 4. Your territory will be from the wilderness in Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River. Listen to this. All the land, right? And land is the main theme of the book of Joshua, land equating to life. He says, all the land of the Hittites and the west of the Mediterranean Sea, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. You know, I found this to be so profound as I was studying and listening and reading that as you think about life, there's a paradigm for how you should be thinking about your life that's symbolic no matter where you're at in life, right? And so here it is. There's four different types of land in the Bible where each person finds themselves. And every one of us today, we're in one of these lands, right? There's Egypt. There's the wilderness, right? There's Canaan, right, the promised land, and there's Babylon. There's Egypt, the wilderness, Canaan, and there's Babylon. Egypt, some people, some of us, we find ourselves in Egypt. What is Egypt, right? Well, it's a big part of the book of Exodus, and Egypt is a place of slavery and false worship. Egypt is a place, it is the place that every single one of us is born into. None of us are born in Eden. There's only two people that were ever born in Eden. That was Adam and Eve. We all long for Eden, but we were born in Egypt. And Egypt is primarily, in the Bible, it is a place of slavery. And you know what? Us living in the U.S., we don't like to use that word, do we, right? But what is the church in America? Well, what is America, church, rather? It's a place where people are addicted. And we don't use the word slavery again for many reasons, but the biblical word for addiction is slavery. You're in bondage. And people are addicted to what? Self-medicating, pornography, sexual immorality, alcohol, amusing ourselves, Instagram. That's right, I said it. Some of us get up, the first thing we grab and start scrolling on is Instagram. I to myself too at sometimes. And so when you see addiction every, everywhere, you know you're in Egypt. Egypt's also a place of false worship where idolatry takes place. It's a place of slavery where it's a place where all of us need to be saved out of. Right? Just like the people of Israel, we all need to be sla- saved out of Egypt. And in a few weeks from now, prayerfully, we're going to be seeing some baptisms in October. And when we see these baptisms and when we celebrate these baptisms, church, every baptism we celebrate, every time somebody goes down into the water and comes out of the water, what they're communicating is that I just came out of the Red Sea. I just came out of Egypt. And we're here to celebrate with everybody as the church. So the way that you come out of Egypt is that you admit that you were a sinner. You're separated from God. You believe in Jesus Christ and what he has done for you and on your behalf and for the whole entire world. And you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. All of us were born into Egypt, but those of us who place our faith in in, in Jesus have come out of Egypt. But like the Israelites, some of us want to go back to Egypt, and we end up going back. And this morning, I want to give you a chance to come out, right? Right? So some of us are in Egypt, and some of us are in the wilderness. And here's the wilderness. It's the place where you get stuck, right? It's the place where you get stuck. It's where you wander. And how do you get out of the wilderness, right? You get out of the wilderness by moving forward and taking courageous faith and walking with Jesus. But you get stuck in the wilderness because you refuse to move forward. You're stuck. There are things that you are unwilling to do. There are ways that you've been unwilling to act. 
There are decisions that you've been unwilling to make. And here's the thing about the wilderness, right? Most of the Pentateuch, the five books of the Bible, the people are in the wilderness. They spent 40 years there. And so what ends up happening is that tip, a lot of the times you end up having two generations in the wilderness. One generation is because of the decisions they've made, right? But then the second generation is because is their kids. Do you understand that when you're in the wilderness, that most of the people in the wilderness, it wasn't their fault to be there? Some of you are in the wilderness because of the decisions that your parents have made. What happens is that every generation of the church finds itself in the wilderness where the former generation wouldn't take ground, where they wouldn't take courageous faith. So we got Egypt, we got the wilderness, and the third place is Canaan. Canaan is not heaven, right? I know it's the promised land in the Bible, right? It's not heaven and it's not Eden. The prom- Here's what it is. Canaan is the place where you fight your battles. Canaan is the place where you fight your battles. The people of God constantly had to fight and go to battle with their enemies. Is that not what we're doing now in war? Fighting the flesh, fighting against our sinful natures, fighting against those who are trying to press darkness into us as we let our light shine in South Florida and beyond. It's a place where you say, Canaan is this place where you say, I believe God and I'm going to engage the enemy based on what God has said in his promises. Here's the danger of being in Canaan. Is that if you're in Canaan and you refuse to fight your battles, do you know where you end up? You end up in Babylon. And none of us want to be there because in Babylon, that's where you're broken. In Babylon, that's where you've given up. In Babylon, it's a place where it's very sad because when you get there, you've been kicked out of the land. God has warned you. He's disciplined you, and then he's had to remove you out of the land. In the wilderness, God calls us to move forward and to cross over and to take courageous faith. But in Babylon, you know what the call is? The call is to go back. And some of us here this morning need to come back. You need to go back. So if you're in Babylon, here's what you do. Maybe you're saying to yourself this morning, man, I used to read my Bible. I don't read it anymore. Go back to loving your word. Some of you today might be the first time you're actually opening up your Bible or looking at your Bible in your phone. Go back. I used to be in meaningful gospel community in a city group or a small group or DNA group. I don't, I'm not in one anymore. I'm too busy. Go back. Amen. I used to pray regularly with my family and, and for my family. Go back. Amen. I used to wake up wanting to live courageously, but now I wake up with a spirit of defeat. Go back. Amen. Go back. Go back to God. Go back to what he had for you in the very beginning. And so we have the promises of God. We have to know the place where we are in. And thirdly, we have to know this. This is so important. And I think maybe just maybe our screen isn't working this morning that you all can start doing this today. Thirdly, we must know the power of meditating on the word of God. We need to know the promises of God. We need to know that the place we're in, am am I in Egypt this morning? Am I in the wilderness? Am I in Canaan? Am I in Babylon? We need to know that, but then we need to know the power of meditating on the word of God. If we want to walk in courageous faith, we have to know the power of meditating on the word of God. Look with me at verse 6. This is what the Lord says. Be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their ancestors to give them as an inheritance. So this is the first of three times that God is going to tell this to Joshua He's going to say, be strong and courageous. But notice what he did not say. He didn't say that you're going to feel strong and courageous. He didn't say you're going to look strong and courageous. He says, I want you to act and orient yourself in the world in this way. That's what he says in verse 7. Above all, be strong and courageous a second time to observe carefully the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from your right or from your left but so that you will have success wherever you go. So he says, be strong and courageous. Why? Because we tend to be weak at times. Do you know that one of the most popular, or most, not most popular, because we don't like to hear this, 
But the, the most common phrase used in the Bible is, do not be afraid. 766 times that comes up in some way, form, or fashion. And so why can we be weak and afraid at times? I'll tell you why. We don't want to lose all that we have. The hardest thing sometimes is knowing that you can lose everything by being courageous. What are some other reasons why we're afraid today? We got so much information. Oh, my gosh, do you see what's going on in the news? The world's going to end. Oh, my gosh, like, you see what's going on here? Like, oh, my, I, I, like, I'm so worried. There's so much information. There's so much negativity coming our way, and, we, and we're not in the word, and we're worrying about other things. Or maybe we get afraid because we have to make a decision too quickly, right? FOMO, right? Fear of missing out, right? But why, y'all know I love movies, why was William Wallace in Braveheart so courageous? That brother didn't have nothing to lose. Freedom! <laughs> he had nothing to lose. And the truth is, the same should be true of us. We don't have anything to lose either. Because last time I checked, when I gave my life to Jesus, right, I gave him everything. Right? I gave him everything. I consider everything a loss for the sake of Christ. Right? I've been crucified by Christ. Right? Like, I've, I've, I've died to myself. If anyone must, wants to come after me, Luke 9 says, he must deny himself and pick up his cross daily. To carry our cross means that we are dying to ourselves. We're dying to all the things that we think we need because we know we need Jesus. He's proven it to us. And so what I want us to do, I don't just want to tell you to be courageous. I want you to see how Joshua was encouraged and how Joshua was motivated to be courageous. And you're like, oh, my God, Pastor Cliff, what's the special sauce? What do I got to do? He meditated on the word of God. He meditated on the word of God. Look with me at verses 8 and 9. This book of instruction, Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, back in your words. This book of instruction must not but depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper. What does it mean to prosper? It means to be successful in the things that matter. And you'll succeed in whatever you do. And so what is courage and how do we get it? Courage is moving forward even though we're fearful. Courage is moving forward even though we're fearful. Biblically, courage is actually believing God and taking your next step. It's like my kid in the pool, right? He's learning how to swim. I'm like, hey, buddy, just jump on in. I'm going to catch you. He's like, man, I don't know, man. I know you love me. But I don't know if I want to jump out there, Dad. You know what I'm saying? But then he jumps for the first time. He's like, ooh, that was fun. I want to do it again. He goes over and over again. Will you jump and take your next step that God's inviting you into this morning? Biblically, courage is actually believing God and taking your next step. It's practicing the sovereignty of God in our lives. And it may... It says that we get courage by meditating on God's word, and that can sound so crazy, can it? Joshua, military warrior, military commander. Hey, man, I'm going to help you be strong. Think about a Bible verse. That's going to make you strong and courageous. But it's the truth. That's exactly what I'm saying. Many of our problems, church, you know why I'm saying this? Many of our problems in life are because we meditate on the wrong things. The number one addiction outside of substance is sexual addiction. What is sexual addiction? It's meditating on that which is forbidden. That's probably one of the biggest problems for us as men. But hold on now, I got to talk to the women too. What's one of y'all's biggest problems, generally speaking? Anxiety. And what is anxiety? It's meditating on all the problems on my life. What do the scriptures say? Whatever is pleasing, whatever is trustworthy, whatever is good, whatever is faithful, right? Think about such things. So we need to be thinking, putting our minds on heavenly things, not on things below. Many people struggle with 
anxiety. Many people struggle with addiction, and many people struggle with us with unforgiveness, with envy and jealousy. And what is that? It's meditating on what other people have done wrong, and you get stuck. I want you to hear this, Radio City, that there is power in meditation, in biblical meditation. And it doesn't happen overnight, but it will happen over time. And here's what happens when you begin to meditate on the word of God daily. Here's what happens when you wake up and you start singing scriptures to yourself. Here's what happens when you read the word so much, the word doesn't, isn't just, you aren't just reading the word, but you're reading the word that it gets in you. What happens is, is that the promises of God get big, gets bigger than the problems in your life. When you get into the word and you study the word and you meditate on the words, God's promise will get big, promises will get bigger than your problems. Imagine if you woke up every day this week and you actually said to yourself, man, I care more about what God says than what man says. I care more about what God says than what people say. I'll just tell you, if that's the case, it will lead to you living a more courageous life. Amen. Pastor Brian Loretz said this in one of his sermons. I thought it was so good. Listen to what he says. He says, we all have an inner lawyer that we need to fire. We all have an inner lawyer that we need to fire. Voices of condemnation. See, some of us, we condemn ourselves. We're our worst enemy. We all have an inner lawyer that we need to fire. Voices of condemnation. Some of them are demonic voices, voices of shame, voices of guilt. He said, that's why you need to be your favorite podcast preacher. You need to be your favorite podcast preacher. If you say, Pastor Cliff, I like to preach on myself, but I like you, I'll say amen, somebody. You need to remind yourself of your identity in Christ and say, I'm free of your opinion. I'm free from my opinion. But you know whose opinion I'm not free from? God's opinion. God's opinion. Imagine if you begin to care more about your heavenly reward than your earthly one. I mean really caring about that. It'll lead to more courage in your life. It doesn't happen in one service. It doesn't happen in one time. That's why we say that the week is just as important as the weekend. It it happens as you daily and regularly begin to diet on the word of God. For the courageous, belief needs to become convictions. Christians believe a bunch of things, but we need to move from belief to a conviction, which is a really firm belief. You see, belief is I would live for this. Conviction is that I would die for this. Belief is that I'm holding on to this. Conviction in some way is saying, no, 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 this is holding on to me. Belief is that I'm, I mark my Bible. Conviction is that the Bible's marked by me. Belief is that I've gotten through my Bible Conviction is that the Bible has gotten through me. And so what he says is, God says, I need you to meditate. And that meditation should not just lead you to belief, but to conviction. And then if you do that and meditate on the word of God, who knows, weeks, days, months from now, you're going to wake up and you're going to say, my whole life is different. I'm not just different because I've, I've been justified by faith and I'm a new creation. But no, I'm marked by differences. My life is different. The things I'm thinking about is different. The way I'm speaking is different. The way I'm acting is different. And you'll be convinced, like, I'm doing what God has said, and so my conscience is clear. We need more men and women who are saying, this is what the Lord has told me, and so I'm doing it. We live in this culture of, like, everybody's tiptoeing on stuff. And, like, well, maybe, or I feel, I feel this way right? Or I I, I just, Pastor Cliff, I know, I I know what you're saying, but I I just feel, right? Like, I just need to follow my heart. No, you don't. A lot of things feel good, if you know what I'm saying, and it ain't good for you. It's not good for you. We need to be people who stand on the word of God, follow the word of God, and do so with love, patience, and care. Because when you start doing something courageous at work, or courageous in your family, things might get harder before they get easy. You start acting differently amongst your family in the workplace, people are going to be looking at you saying, who are you? And not like, who are you? Like, who are you? Like, like, who are you? You know what I'm saying? 
who do you think you are? You can't do that. Are you hanging out with them Christians? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. You have to be resolved with so much conviction and courage that you're able to say, this is who I am. I know my God, and I'm walking with my God. Amen? Amen. We need courage. Look with me at verse 9 as we get ready to come to an end. Verse 9, he says, God says, haven't I commanded you? He says it a final time. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Does that last sentence sound familiar? For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It sounds familiar because it is familiar. And it's familiar because it's the word of our Lord Jesus in Matthew 28, right before he goes back and ascends to the Father. He gives the great commission telling his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. And at the end of verse 20, he says, and remember, I am with you always to the end of this age. To walk in courageous faith, we must know the promises of God. We must know the place we're in. We must know the power of meditating on the word of God. And finally, it means we must know the person of Jesus Christ. And so as we come to a close, I want to pray for you right now. And I want to give you an opportunity to literally take a, a, a physical posture of courageous faith. See, some of you are going to need the courage this morning to come to Christ. Some of you need the courage to come to Christ, the courage to admit that you're a sinner, that you're far from God, that you don't know the Lord. You, you might, I believe, no, no, you haven't really believed and surrendered where Jesus is at the throne and you are on your knees before him saying, I need you. You need the courage to surrender your life to him fully and trust that his ultimate promise is by faith. Some of you are going to need the courage this morning. Listen to me on this. Some of you, I know I'm looking out here. You need the courage to walk away. To walk away. There's a relationship that's toxic and you need to walk away. There's a job that's unhealthy and keeping you from what you need to do for Jesus. You need to walk away. There's an addiction that's in your life right now that you need to be freed from and you need to walk away. You may not come forward this morning when I ask you to come forward. But you need to walk away in your heart. You tell yourself your marriage is okay, but it's not. You tell yourselves your kids are doing fine, but they're not. You need to walk away. Some of you are going to need the courage this morning. You need courage. And you need courageous faith to publicly identify with Christ. Maybe you know Christ and you're in Christ. But it means you might need to step forward by getting baptized in a few weeks. Maybe it's letting somebody at your job know that you're actually a believer. Maybe this morning, the only person that knows that you're a Christian is, is you and God. You need to let somebody else know. It's time to truly live and see yourself as a missionary. Who is far from God but close to you that you can talk to about your relationship with Jesus? Some of you all here, maybe somebody you know, needs the courage to face bad news. As a pastor, I get lots of bad news, people getting diagnosed with prognoses and people losing loved ones. And you need the courage to be able to stand up and say, I'm not okay, and that it's okay not to be okay. Some of you need the courage to forgive. You've been stuck in the wilderness because you just can't forgive. You look at that person that's in your life, and all you see is what they've done to you. You can't even look at what they're doing for you now in your life. Forgiving means I'm no longer going to be defined by what they did to me. Whatever it is, church, we want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. We want you, I want to ask you this morning as the worship team comes up here, deacons, if you guys could come up here in just a few moments and stand on each edge. I get one deacon here, one deacon in the middle, and one deacon on the right. I want you to come up, even if you're afraid. If you need prayer, if you need courageous faith this morning, I want you to come and stand up and walk up and ask for prayer. Don't leave here today without moving forward in your faith. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you so much. We're so thankful that you ultimately are the courageous one. You are the one who lived the perfect life. You are the one who died according to the scriptures for our sins. You are the one who victoriously resurrected 
from the grave, Lord, and gives us life. You are the one who says, I'm with you. The reason why, Lord, we can be courageous is because you say you are with us. And so, Father, I pray for those this morning who you may not be with, those who may have not placed their faith in you. I pray, Lord, that today that you'd help them take courageous faith by saying, I believe. I believe, Jesus. I believe that I'm a sinner, and I admit it. And I know that my sin separates me from you, but I believe that you lived the life I couldn't live, that you died for me. And I want to place faith in your life, death, and resurrection so that I can walk courageously with you. Some of us need to take a step of faith physically, Lord, and say, you know what, today, I don't care who's here, I don't care who's looking at me, I just got my eyes fixed on you, and I'm going to go to leaders in the church, deacons and, and myself and staff who can pray for you this morning. Lord, as we sing this song right now, Lord, may we bless you because you've blessed us. May we love you because you first loved us. And Lord, may we live courageously, Lord, because you first lived courageously for us. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.